Let me introduce myself. My name is Jonathan. I have never felt such intense anger in my life. This particular anger has a nature that no one should experience. At that moment, I had an irresistible desire to physically harm two people. Now, you may wonder what could have caused such rage in me. Let me tell you about it. It all started about five weeks ago when my wife and I witnessed a huge change, similar to the transformation of a chameleon. She began to show a rejection of any form of intimacy, including intimate actions that are usually performed by a husband and wife. This unexpected change immediately aroused my suspicions. In the past, my ex-girlfriend had betrayed my trust, and when the truth finally came out, I learned some solid and difficult lessons in my life. Interestingly, I have never told about the existence of the first girl in my life. However, I doubt that the disclosure of this information would have changed anything. As her change moved into the second week, I felt the need to look deeper into this issue. Unlike people who seek outside help to solve their problems, I am not one of those who trust others or count on their help. Rather, I am a practitioner who knows how to solve my problems on my own. Therefore, during the lunch break, I quietly followed her from the workplace. To my surprise, she parked her car at the motel and quickly headed to room 104. I felt in my gut that she was cheating on me. It didn't make sense because her job didn't involve any communication with clients outside of the workplace. Moreover, she did not even have direct contact with clients as she worked in the accounting department. When I found out about her infidelity, it hurt me. But it wasn't as painful as the emotional abuse I had already experienced from her, ridicule, insults, and refusals. The person she had an affair with turned out to be her colleague. Even though they worked in different departments, there were rumors that he was a member of the rapid response team, rapidly rising through the ranks. For two weeks, I had been thinking about several strategies to solve the problem. In the end, I settled on a direct approach. Not wanting to spend a significant amount of money to confirm what I already suspected, instead, I waited patiently for this moment, knowing full well that my wife was hugging another man behind this door. Despite the internal struggle, I constantly reminded myself that I should not resort to cruelty. It was not easy because the temptation to attack his wife was very strong. But I knew I had to confront them and gather evidence. In my current emotional state, I still had the opportunity to go to court with a claim for the loss of love, which would undoubtedly have severe consequences for both my wife and her employer. I had a feeling that the gentleman on the way up was on the verge of being on the way down and this made me believe that events would develop exactly as they did. My main task was to get the necessary photos and then hand over the divorce papers to my future ex-wife. And at this time, the locks were just being changed in our house, thanks to a locksmith whom I had already paid before leaving home in anticipation of this moment. I carefully redistributed our finances, ensuring an equal division. In addition, all our credit cards were cancelled on my initiative. The last two weeks have been filled with various preparations, and now the final shock looms on the horizon. As for Simone's reaction, I can't predict with certainty how she will react. In my opinion, she will find happiness and not be upset. But there is a possibility that in the near future, she will feel guilty. It is worth noting that my lawyer, who has extensive experience in divorce cases, assures me that this feeling of guilt will disappear as soon as she gets her lawyer. As for my feelings for her, one might wonder if I still love her. At the moment, I feel only hatred for her, open and complete at the same time. I'm having a deep internal struggle, wondering if she really loves me or if it's just an annoying mistake on her part, an oversight in solving the issue. I have a faint hope that we will be able to restore our relationship, but on a logical level, I understand that this is unlikely. I cannot accept a wife who would betray my trust by treason. I completely lost confidence in her. The love I still have for her is just a remnant that has not yet had time to digest the sudden and so radical change that has occurred in such a short period of time. The motel manager gave me the room key after I gave him a hundred dollar bill and a promise not to disturb the peace, despite the fact that my wife and her lover chose this place for their secret meetings. I don't blame the manager, he seems to be a genuinely nice person. Interestingly, he also mentioned his ex-wife and that there are certain similarities between our situations. Quietly opening the door with the key, I entered the room. He carefully closed the door, leaving it slightly ajar. Picking up a digital camera, 
I settled inside the room, remembering how grateful I was that I received this camera as a birthday present three months ago. I couldn't help but appreciate its quality, but the scene before me quickly captured my attention. She desperately begged the man to let her go, his anger was clearly expressed when he tried to get up. Deciding to capture the evidence, I took a few more pictures, watching her suffering in weakness. Simone's tears streamed down her face as she tried to hide from him while he continued his disgusting actions. I mentally wished that he would make the decision, so my further actions were instinctive. Who are you? Get out of here before I punch you in the face, he said. I'm the future ex-husband of the woman you're sleeping with. It is still unknown whose muzzle will be stuffed. I very much doubt that you are capable of harming me, I replied. When he approached me, I shifted to the side, carefully put the camera down, and turned slightly to the right, giving him the opportunity to approach me from the left side. Loosening the grip of the camera, I began to turn quickly, simultaneously raising my hand forcefully. When my fist collided with his face, his legs forcefully lifted off the ground, fueled by a powerful mixture of anger, pain, and slight trembling. At that moment, I could not believe that I had allowed myself such unnecessary irritation, but apparently, emotions had surpassed my consciousness. Bending down, I carefully checked if there were any signs of life in him. When I found a pulse, I felt relief, which allowed me to relax the tension in my body for a moment. At this time, I heard Simone's incessant mumbling. Her words filled the whole air. Turning to her, I saw that she had stopped abruptly, her voice muffled by her newfound fear. It dawned on me that she had never seen this side of me before, this raw and unbridled version that had been released. I probably didn't look at all like the one she saw at breakfast. It was clear that she had betrayed me, and I could not get rid of the feeling of anger towards her. I didn't want to have anything to do with her cheating anymore. Tears streamed down her face, she sat and trembled, hugging herself tightly, avoiding eye contact. She seemed unable to look me in the eye. This behavior has become more and more frequent lately, but at that moment, she realized that I knew about her actions. The game was over. I noticed that there was a flicker of fear in her eyes when she looked at me but quickly looked away. I'm filing for divorce. The locks in the house have been changed. I have opened a bank account to which your share of our property has been transferred. You've received an official notification, our relationship is over. Thank you for not contributing. The papers were placed on her lap as she tried to hide under the sheets. She glanced at them briefly, then met my gaze. No words were said. At that moment, an unusual emptiness reigned in the room, but it was clear that my emptiness would end up being more painful. At that moment, she realized that no words could fix the situation that had developed between us. It seemed that she didn't know how to fix our broken relationship, and it became clear that our relationship had been deteriorating for much longer than in the last few weeks. I turned and left, her desperate screams came to me as I left through the door. Wait, let me explain, please, Jonathan, please, she pleaded. Despite her pleas, I kept walking, deciding to close my eyes from her gaze. They were filled with unshed tears, and I knew that if I turned around, I would weaken my resolve and not fulfill my entire plan. There were a lot of problems on our way, which left behind a number of unresolved issues because of which I did not want to return to the past. What was once a beautiful union has now turned to dust. When I arrived home, a patient locksmith was waiting for me. He diligently replaced all three entrance locks and reprogrammed the garage door opener. Thanking him for his promptness, I expressed my gratitude to him and, as a sign of gratitude, slipped a $20 bill. Sitting at the kitchen table in a place that once held memories of a loving home, I thought about the years spent together. Simone's sudden change remained a mystery to me, as did her sharp disregard for my virtues, which she had once so clearly recognized. I didn't understand her motives, but I was well aware that our relationship had come to an end. In five weeks, pain and harsh words turned me into a completely different person. Unfortunately, Simone didn't seem to notice this transformation, just as I didn't notice the changes in her. Suddenly, the phone interrupted my thoughts. Looking at the caller ID, I saw that it was Simone's mom. I answered the phone and greeted her. Hi, John is listening. What's the matter? To my surprise, Simone's mother, Doris, said that Simone came to her in tears and confessed that she had somehow ruined our marriage. Curious, I replied, 
Well, Doris, it's a little complicated. Simone will have to explain what happened. Today I found her in a motel room and handed her the divorce papers. John, I don't understand what happened between you, Doris said. I sincerely apologize, Doris. You know how much I love you and Sam, and this whole story is undoubtedly hard for all of us. But nevertheless, it is necessary that everything should turn out this way, I said, tears flowing down my face as I uttered these words. I felt a deep affection for Simone's parents, who showed me great kindness throughout all the years of our relationship with Simone. The anguish and bewilderment in Doris's voice pierced my soul. I felt relieved that our conversation took place on the phone. I didn't want them to see me like this. John, can't you find a way to solve this problem? Doris asked. I doubt it very much, Doris. This is a serious problem, really serious, and this is the problem that destroys everything, I replied. The silence on the other end of the phone indicated that Doris was having a hard time digesting such difficult news. I sympathized with her. Just last night, Doris, Sam, and I had dinner together, and Simone was affectionate and gentle in the presence of her parents. The whole picture took me by surprise. When we were driving home, we were fighting. On the way home, I met a cold attitude, which was not surprising. After all, during the time spent with Doris and Sam, we created the image of the perfect couple to protect Sam from the pain caused by his daughter's act. I hid our differences. Looking back, I should have somehow warned them before taking the steps I did. Sam's health was already fragile due to years of hard work and smoking, which negatively affected his well-being. Although Doris was in good health, she was constantly worried about Sam. I was overcome with regret that I had not warned them about the chaotic situation. A few days later, my phone rang again. Glancing at the caller ID, I noticed that it was Simone's father calling. Hello, I greeted. John, I need to discuss something important regarding my daughter's tumultuous relationship. Simone confided in her mother last night, and I was present at this conversation. Could we arrange a meeting? I want to share with you what she had to go through, he said. Deeply loving Simone's parents, I readily agreed. During our meeting, Simone's father recounted her conversation with her mother, passing it on to me. Simone, I'm your mother, and John is like a son to me. I'm sorry that John handed you the divorce papers. I need you to tell me more about what happened. Just mentioning that John caught you in a motel room isn't enough. I want to understand why you were at the motel and who you were with, Doris said. Mom, our relationship has deteriorated compared to what it was when we first got married. Jonathan was very busy at work, doing a lot of projects. We discussed this issue because it significantly affected our personal life. I knew that all his hard work in a few months would lead to a well-deserved promotion. You don't understand what happened at my work. Greg found out that I made a few mistakes in the employee records. Although it was not a serious mistake, it was a significant blunder on my part, which could jeopardize my chances of a promotion and a salary increase, as well as hinder my promotion in the company. Taking advantage of this circumstance, Greg, being the man he is, in fact forced me to meet him for lunch to avoid the consequences of my mistake. I reluctantly agreed to provide him with an intimate service that one time. Although the situation did not please me, the reason why I was able to decide on such a step was that John and I had difficulties in our relationship, and for the last six months, we lacked intimacy. It was only after the first meeting with Greg that I realized that I was eager to get the experience that others had already enjoyed. Jonathan was my only partner, and I've never been with anyone else. Our first intimacy occurred in Greg's office during lunch break. As usual, everyone left, and I stayed. Greg was waiting for me. He even gave me a surprise. He gave me a small bottle of my favorite wine, which was accompanied by cheese and crackers. As a rule, the lunch break lasted an hour, during which everyone went to the nearest restaurants or to street vendors to have a snack. Personally, I preferred to have a quick snack in the cart and retire to the park. Surprisingly, our absence went unnoticed that day. Greg turned out to be much kinder than the formidable blackmailer I had initially imagined him to be. This meeting was a turning point for me, which allowed me to discard the preconceived attitude towards him. Despite the fact that I understood that it was wrong from a moral point of view, I wanted more of such forbidden moments. Despite the fact that I still love my husband, Greg treated me in such a way that I felt like nothing more than his property. 
Being with him, I completely let go of my inhibitions and became a completely different person. By the end of lunch, I was doing things with Greg that I hadn't even thought about with my husband. We only managed to settle everything before the others returned, and when I left his office, my anger at him somewhat dissipated. That day, feeling his sugary taste on my lips, I could not get rid of the thought of the next meeting. This thought came to mind unexpectedly. Having understood my desire for Greg, he himself wanted more than just a one-time meeting. The next day, Greg came up to me to discuss it, and we got intimate again in the office. But during this intimacy, I noticed that Greg spoke negatively about Jonathan. These subtle insults continued for the next two weeks when we were together, and Greg even suggested that Jonathan might be unfaithful. Given the circumstances of our personal life at home, it didn't take me long to adopt Greg's negative attitude towards Jonathan. In the weeks that followed, I noticed that I began to belittle and criticize Jonathan in front of everyone except you and Dad. Deep down, I was afraid that both of you would understand how I was behaving, so I tried to maintain the appearance of a devoted and loving wife when you and your father were around. But over time, as meetings at the motel became more frequent, my relationship with Jonathan deteriorated, and my relationship with Greg grew from a simple intimate contact into a full-fledged romance. Craig suggested continuing to meet at the motel as a temporary solution until we find a more suitable option. He explained that his wife began to suspect something, perhaps because someone at work mentioned how often we were seen together. Despite the fact that we worked in different departments, there was no question of parting with our spouses. Our meetings were aimed exclusively at physical intimacy. Looking back, I couldn't recognize the love, respect, and understanding that Jonathan offered me, and I preferred a relationship fueled by attraction and desire. I gave myself to him without much resistance. Jonathan always showed me respect, never took anything without my full consent. Greg, on the other hand, had no affection for me, which allowed him to take and command freely. He had a small compartment where he could satisfy his desires, and his wife provided him with the necessary emotional support. On the other hand, I took Greg's statements about Jonathan seriously, which made me prefer an exciting intimate relationship with Greg over developing an emotional connection with my husband. Reflecting on the past, I realized that 10 weeks ago, I made the grossest mistake in my life, and unfortunately, it is no longer possible to correct it. When Jonathan entered the room that fateful day, I was dumbfounded and desperately tried to hide. I begged Greg to stop, but when Greg finally stepped back and got out of bed, I looked into Jonathan's eyes and saw a complete stranger. In her, there was an unusual tension in his behavior. Without saying a word, Jonathan started taking pictures of us, and Greg, muttering something unintelligible, indifferently put the digital camera on the next table. I was completely shocked by what happened next. Greg, filled with anger, aggressively attacked Jonathan, but a moment later, I saw Greg thrown up. He flew two meters into the air and then collapsed on his back. My eyes met Jonathan's, and shame overwhelmed me, making it impossible to maintain further eye contact. Desperately trying to shield myself from what was happening, I covered myself with a sheet. At that moment, Jonathan uttered offensive words, calling me corrupt, and casually threw several folded papers on the bed. In the midst of all this chaos, I heard that I had been filed for divorce. My eyes were glued to the sheets, and I could not understand that soon my husband's anger would be directed at me. Fear and humiliation flowed through my veins, making me tremble and be vulnerable. Feeling a sense of shame and regret, Jonathan abruptly turned around and headed for the exit, clutching the camera in his hands, which he took from the table. Desperately trying to reach him, I began to cry. Although I don't remember the exact words, I had the feeling that everything I said sounded completely empty. After this unpleasant encounter, I took a long shower, completely not thinking about Greg's well-being, whether he was alive or not. It didn't matter to me at that moment. Soon, the manager of the motel looked into the room and said that Jonathan had bought a key from him. The manager's contemptuous look made me feel like I was nothing more than dirt under his feet. He talked about how he found his wife with another man, just like Jonathan, and this was the main motive that prompted him to give Jonathan the key. He didn't need to talk about it directly, I already understood everything. I made a colossal mistake. I foolishly lost the most precious thing in my life, all because I was carried away by a fleeting affair and believed that it was something extraordinary. The next day, 
I came to work, and three men were waiting for me in my office, the president, the HR manager, and the person I thought was the company's lawyer. But they didn't want any problems with the law, so they paid me some money and sent me on my way. It was an unpleasant situation, but at least it was over. Greg and I didn't talk anymore after that. It became clear that our relationship was built on deception and manipulation. I learned a hard lesson and swore that I would never let anyone take advantage of me like that again. When I left the office, I was overcome with a sense of relief. I may have lost my job, but I have regained my self-respect. From this day on, I will be more careful, more attentive to the people I let into my life. And as for Greg, he will forever remain a painful reminder of the chapter of my life that I happily left behind. I received a severance package, but that was all. Greg was escorted out of the building by security and handed over to the police. It turned out that he was involved in several other heinous cases that came to light during the interrogation. Greg had serious problems, as it turned out that he was stealing from the company in various ways, whether it was small sums here and there or fraud with receipts from business trips. All this accumulated to such an extent that he was charged with grand theft. As a result, Greg's wife decided to leave him. Having made a difficult decision, they moved with their three children to her parents on the East Coast. Meanwhile, Greg was in jail awaiting trial. Initially, I was asked to testify, but after discussing this issue with the district attorney's office, it became clear that my testimony could harm rather than help. Therefore, they decided not to involve me in the trial. Subsequently, I was approached by Greg's lawyer, who wanted me to testify in support of his client. But when I told the details of how Greg blackmailed me into an intimate relationship and subsequently manipulated my relationship with my husband, the lawyer also decided that my testimony would not be useful in court. Mom, I can't believe I messed it up like this, Simone said. Simone, you've made the most serious mistake imaginable. You not only disappointed your parents and yourself, but you also let your husband down. Girl, you have completely destroyed two marriages and the love of your spouse. You've sunk to the lowest level. Despite this, I still love you because you are my daughter, but I have lost all respect for you, her mother replied. Sam informed me that Doris and he had allowed Simone to stay with them. There was complete confusion in his voice. This news brought tears to my eyes. I was sympathetic to the fact that these were really good people who, unfortunately, were involved in this unpleasant situation. Looking back, I hesitated to tell Simone's parents about this because I knew that it would lead to her receiving a warning, which could prevent me from obtaining the necessary evidence. But the photos I received were not decisive for the court unless her lawyer decided to use an adversarial approach. In this case, I had six credible witnesses ready to testify about their involvement. Although I used the term affair with some reservation, it remains unclear whether Simone really loved this guy or whether she voluntarily participated in this situation from the very beginning. This uncertainty is connected with her father's previous statements, from which it followed that Greg had certain levels of influence on Simone at the very beginning of their relationship. Meanwhile, my lawyer was enjoying the way the case was presented to Simone's employer. At the same time, I was preparing for a visit to the motel room. While I was preparing, my lawyer had already filed a case in court, and surprisingly, in just 20 minutes, he was on the phone with the legal service of the company. Their reaction was mixed, delight and denial. Naturally, the conversation took a different turn when he started talking about the affidavit. Suddenly, the company's point of view on this issue completely changed. Based on the information that the lawyer shared with me, it was possible to say with a high degree of probability that Simone, the lover, and all the other participants in the process would be dismissed from their posts the very next day unless they could give a reasonable explanation for their actions. Personally, I understood that the case against Greg on the charge of alienation of affection was significantly strengthened due to the reaction of his employer. We had affidavits from three of his colleagues and one of hers, testifying to their clandestine activities during working hours. The company's executives secretly guessed about their actions, but no one, including me, came across them about this. We had sworn statements from the owner of the motel and the cleaning lady, who in total acted as six witnesses. In addition, I had photographic evidence confirming the fact of sexual intercourse during working hours. The reason for their visits to the motel was a desire not to attract the attention of colleagues. As Greg noticed that their behavior was becoming too noticeable, he was well acquainted with the company's workplace relations policy. 
my lawyer gathered a significant amount of information, and we also had a printed copy of their company's ethics actions and workplace relations policy. It was at this time that I discovered Simone's relationship with the jerk, which lasted a little over five weeks before I realized something was wrong. So, by the time I ran into them at the motel, Simone had been unfaithful to me for ten weeks. The disclosure of their affair five weeks before was an incredibly difficult period in my life and was one of three similar moments that caused me strong emotions. At that moment, I sincerely hoped that I would never experience this again for the rest of my life. When I left the motel room that day, I felt as calm as I had never felt before. Simone was lying on the bed, tears streaming down her face, and Greg continued to lie unconscious on the floor. Standing in the hallway, the motel manager came up to me as he handed him the key. He put a comforting hand on my shoulder. It's hard now, but everything will get better. Take the time to rediscover yourself, and eventually, you will find someone new, he reassured me. Everything will be fine. He did not embellish, admitting that the recovery process would be painful and depend on the depth of my love and care for her. Thank you, I replied, admitting that I had already come to this understanding. Simone did not put up any resistance during the divorce process, making it surprisingly easy. Even my lawyer and possibly her lawyer were struck by her lack of resistance. It was obvious that she was in great pain, but she never tried to justify her actions. As soon as the divorce was finalized, the litigation with her former employer quickly ended. Their sole purpose was my disappearance, and they were willing to pay for my lawyer's services, court costs, and even offer a significant amount of money to secure my consent. But since then, Simone has been facing numerous problems. It is difficult for her to navigate in the circumstances, living with her parents who have undergone significant changes because of her actions. It is an incredibly difficult ordeal for her. The burden of perceiving herself as an imposter is hanging over her, and it will undoubtedly take her a long time to get rid of this label. Although she has the opportunity to start life anew, I hope that eventually, she will be able to move forward and rebuild her life, easing the pain that is now consuming her every hour. I want her to at least learn a valuable and painful lesson from this experience. Only time will tell the extent of her growth. As for Greg, his incarceration gives me a sense of satisfaction, at least for a moment. Perhaps now he will have a chance to experience various forms of intimacy, hopefully, this time from the recipient's side. I can't feel any sympathy for him because I don't consider him a real man. It was clear to me that he had a family, a wife, and three children. I happened to get to know his wife closely during a chaotic divorce, and I couldn't help but notice her bright appearance. It struck me how stupid Greg was acting. He had everything that one could wish for, but he recklessly threw it all away, apparently driven by some unquenchable desire to get satisfaction from intimate life, which his wife could not satisfy. After witnessing this, I made a difficult decision to quit my job. My employers were stunned by my sudden departure and sincerely tried to persuade me to change my mind. But the problems I faced in my personal life were too serious and did not allow me to continue working effectively. Despite all their efforts, when they realized that my decision was final, they kindly provided a generous letter of recommendation, which I gratefully accepted. I recently started a new job on the West Coast, having moved here about a year ago. While working here, I had the pleasure of meeting a wonderful girl, Kelly, who in my opinion, is worthy of holding on to. Although I still have trust issues, she and I share a common experience, as she was also betrayed by her ex-husband. This similarity has created a strong bond between us. Life, of course, presents me with its difficulties and teaches me valuable lessons, but I am optimistic that the situation is gradually improving. A week ago, Simone's father called me with terrible news after which I still can't come to my senses. He said that Simone had completely lost her way and became addicted to illegal drugs. She struggled with this addiction together, but to no avail, and soon they found Simone's lifeless body in their own house. As it turned out later, she took too many pills from which she died. I sympathized with Sam and said that they can count on my any support. Story 2 my name is Dave, and I'm in a relationship with my girlfriend Kelly. Our story began with the fact that I accidentally overheard on the phone a sincere conversation between Kelly and one of her close friends. We had been together for about two years, and I was starting to get to the point where I felt ready to ask a question and ask her to marry me. Kelly is one of those women who often go unnoticed in a crowd. 
At first glance, you may not understand how beautiful and loving she is. She has a habit of hiding her figure under clothes of large sizes because she does not like the attention that her almost perfect figure attracts. But if you are lucky enough to get to know her better, you will quickly understand the depth of her beauty and the warmth of her heart. Our paths crossed at a New Year's Eve party hosted by a mutual friend. I had no idea that this chance meeting would lead to a love story. We discovered a lot of common interests, and although at first, she did not charm me, after a week, I plucked up the courage and asked her out. We dated for several months, and one evening she suddenly turned up at my house wanting to create a special moment. I prepared a delicious dinner for her. When we settled down on my couch to watch a movie together, our affectionate gestures turned into passionate kisses. The next moment, we were in my bed, and I was shocked at how uninhibited Kelly turned out to be, which I didn't even realize. She showed fearlessness and adventurism, leaving no boundaries. I was completely overwhelmed, desperately trying to catch up. Throughout the night, but it was after that night that our bond became stronger than ever before. Our relationship was not without difficulties. Being a person who tends to forget or ignore certain things, I unwittingly caused her pain or disappointment. On the other hand, she, being a typical woman, sometimes did things that infuriated me. We didn't live together mainly because of the strong influence of her parents on her life. She believed that moving in with me, despite our close relationship, would create difficulties in relations with her parents. But out of deep love for her, I respected her decision, out of respect for her parents, and understanding the importance of their relationship, I never insisted that she move in with me. But that day, I overheard a conversation between her and her friend, which caused me to feel fear and guilt. It became clear that I lacked the ability to remember important dates, such as anniversaries or special events, such as Valentine's Day. I often forgot about them, and sometimes it took me several days to realize my mistake. After an intimate evening, Kelly left me, and while I was in the bathroom, she apparently called Gina. I was completely stunned by what I heard, as I thought our relationship was thriving. She was talking about how I forgot about Valentine's Day this year and it makes her doubt my feelings, that sometimes she thinks that I'm dating her just to keep a constant presence in my life, that I constantly lose sight of important points concerning her, including important dates. I was in a bit of pain. I genuinely loved Kelly with all my heart and now she was telling Gina that I was just keeping her by my side as a constant life partner. I was shocked. Deep down, I can't help but feel responsible for this situation. Kelly expressed her disappointment, explaining that the reason for her experiences is my poor memory. Next, she wondered why an attractive guy who does not remember small details is needed. Having gathered her resolve, she said that if I forgot about Valentine's Day, that she would end our relationship. There was a moment of silence when it seemed to Gina that she was talking about something very important. Reflecting on the fact that Gina had been supporting her all this time, Kelly wished she had turned to her for advice earlier. But judging by Gina's behavior in the past, Kelly doubted that this was the case. Gina and I have always had a strained relationship. She believed that Kelly deserved someone better than me, and I constantly felt attacks from her when we were next to Kelly. In all the two years of our acquaintance, I could not recall a single case when she would say something positive about me. I sat there and couldn't shake the feeling that Gina was trying to convince Kelly to leave me. Anger began to build up in me, and instead of directing it at my own shortcomings in dating and relationships, I decided to put the blame solely on Gina. Kelly kept talking, emphasizing that this issue goes beyond just Valentine's Day, that the gaps in my memory are becoming quite unpleasant for her, sometimes she has to remind me of important dates like anniversaries, that if I could remember at least one date and surprise her, maybe she wouldn't be so disappointed, that it makes her doubt that she is really dear to me. Sometimes it seems to her that she is nothing more to me than an object for satisfaction. After a long conversation, she said goodbye to Gina. I felt that Gina had some ulterior motive connected with Kelly and with me. My dislike for her intensified. Who does she think she is, trying to bring discord into my relationship with Kelly? I was getting more and more angry, and perhaps this was the impetus for the subsequent events. Later that day, after leaving Kelly at her house, I went to a friend for advice. I trusted Mike, hoping he could help me. Unfortunately, he didn't help much. It seemed like he was looking forward to the breakup between Kelly and me to make his move on her. As I was thinking, the thought of Sam came to my mind. 
We haven't talked for a long time, but I believe that he would be able to prompt and give answers to my current questions. As I prepared to propose to Kelly, I found myself desperately clinging to our relationship. In fact, I was planning to touch on this topic after a shower on that fateful day. But having accidentally overheard this conversation, I had no choice but to abandon my plans. And yet, Sam turned out to be a true friend, giving me invaluable advice and support. Mindful of my unreliable memory, I tried to write down most of the details. As soon as I left his apartment, I immediately started acting to secure a future with Kelly. Remembering her favorite restaurant, which she repeatedly mentioned, I quickly booked a table. It occurred to me that Gina had also repeatedly discussed this place. Looking back, I wondered if Gina was bragging about her boyfriend inviting her to such a posh place, hinting that I couldn't afford to do the same for Kelly. Anyway, I didn't waste any time to complete the booking and make the necessary prepayment for our place. While buying a special gift for Kelly, I came across a wonderful brooch. But when I found myself in a jewelry store, I couldn't resist looking through a collection of wedding rings. Without thinking twice, I chose an amazing engagement ring with diamonds in a beautiful frame. It had a high price, which made me go to the bank and transfer money from the savings to the settlement to make a purchase right there. After that, I bought myself a new suit at the store where a helpful salesman helped me get dressed. Realizing my ignorance of fashion issues, I relied on this seller, who helped me make the right choice, and he coped with the task perfectly, creating a stylish image for me. When I came out of the fitting room, I was stunned by the sound with which several women were whispering in my address. Embarrassment instantly seized me, my cheeks turned crimson. They giggled playfully, teasing me a little as they left. Despite the fact that their comments were complimentary, I was struck by how easily people treat others despite their kind words. I couldn't help but feel uncomfortable. Deciding to get rid of this feeling, I went to get a new suit and then to the barber shop to get a new hairstyle. This decision has become a difficult task for me because I have always preferred my harsh, low-maintenance appearance. At that moment, I plunged into the world of megasexuality, not knowing if it was a wise decision. Sam was strongly in favor of this, believing that it was necessary. Later in the evening, Kelly couldn't resist complimenting my hairstyle, clearly appreciating the transformation. Wow, Dave, your hairstyle looks amazing. Why did you decide to change your hairstyle? What is it? She asked. I answered casually, just thought you'd like it. I'm already tired of my old hairstyle. Kelly seemed intrigued by my sudden change, which made her ask the question, tired of the old haircut, huh? Why is it so important? My nerves got stronger. I felt the weight of expectations and pressure on me today. Kelly caught me off guard by asking questions she wouldn't normally ask. I couldn't help but wonder if she and Gina had spent too much time together today, as there was a certain tension in the air. Despite the fact that I was usually confident around Kelly, I felt nervous and held my tongue. My heart was pounding as if I had asked someone out for the first time, and now I'm inviting her to Valentine's Day for a special dinner and all that. Dave, are you feeling well? Are you inviting me to a romantic dinner? Yes, what's so unusual about us going out together? Well, this is the first time you've asked me out on this particular day. Yes, Kelly, you know I love you. I just wanted to show you this. Hmm, I had some plans, but I suppose I can cancel them. Plans? What are your plans for Valentine's Day anyway? Oh, nothing special. I was going to go to a party with Gina, but since you invited me, of course, I'll go with you. Gina and the party, Kelly, is there something you want to tell me? I'm wondering what's going on between us, Dave. What's been bothering you lately? You know that Gina and I have a long history of dating. I just figured you weren't going to ask me out on Friday, so I made an appointment with Gina. Don't take it too seriously. I felt that Kelly was a little upset with me. I admit I might have seemed jealous. In truth, I was, and I was also afraid of losing the person I love most in the world. That evening, Kelly decided to come home early. I was sure that Kelly was going to end our relationship. She was always quite active in an intimate way and rarely went without it for more than a couple of days, except during the menstrual cycle. But that wasn't the time. And thinking about it, I realized that we hadn't spent much time together all this week, and on Friday morning, everything went wrong. 
I got a call from the restaurant at work and was informed that my order had been cancelled. Obviously, some very rich man booked the entire restaurant and demanded to cancel all other orders. Despite my heated arguments, my efforts were in vain. The waiter remained adamant in his decision to cancel the order and return the money. In a panic, I began desperately looking for alternative booking options, but I was disappointed. All the seats were occupied. With a feeling of despair, I reluctantly accepted the idea of a cozy romantic dinner at home. But my hopes were dashed when an unexpected second phone call brought terrible news. There was a fire in my house. The apartment located directly under mine turned to ashes, and my belongings, including treasured clothes and personal items, were soaked and destroyed beyond recognition. I had to look for a new place to live, and when I leaned back in my chair at my desk, a wave of emptiness came over me. In a matter of minutes, my whole life was destroyed. It was already impossible to save this day. When I was only a few hours away from meeting Kelly, I suddenly remembered about the ring. It was lying on the dresser in my now ruined apartment. I immediately left work and headed home, or rather, to what was left of it. The once cozy room had turned into a large, dark abyss. My things and clothes were not only ruined but also turned into ashes. When I looked at the place where my chest of drawers once stood, a huge hole opened up in front of me, leading to the basement. Sitting on the curb and burying my head in my hands, I couldn't help but think about what other troubles awaited me. I didn't know yet that there is no limit to how much worse it can get. Suddenly, my attention switched to Kelly, who was driving by in my supposed good friend's jeep. She quickly looked away, noticing my devastated state on the side of the road. At that moment, I realized that I had lost her, and it seems that my so-called friend took advantage of the situation. Later, I was allowed to rummage through the trash, and to my surprise, I found the ring still safely hidden in the box. Despite this small victory, I couldn't help but wonder about its significance in my current situation. I stopped by my parents' house in the suburbs and refreshed myself by taking a shower and putting myself in order. I still had some clothes there, even if a little outdated but still suitable. After spending some time at home, I became increasingly annoyed by the incessant conversations of my parents, so I decided to get out into the city. I ended up at Sam's. As soon as he saw me, he immediately welcomed me. Both he and his wife showed great concern for my well-being. I pulled Sam aside and told him the events of the day. He was amazed at how quickly things changed for the worse. We had dinner together, and while eating, the phone suddenly rang. Sam turned to me and handed me the phone. This is Gina, he said, emphasizing the importance of the call. When I picked up the phone, I was overwhelmed by a flood of emotions, anger, disappointment, deep resentment. Without any warning, I poured out all these feelings on her. You called the gloat, didn't you? Are you happy now? I bitterly accused. Kelly, the person I thought was my true love, is now with someone else, and my world seems to be falling apart. I wouldn't even be surprised if you were behind the destruction of my house. Well, well, rejoice in my misfortune. Looks like you finally got what you wanted, Gina. I can't figure out what happened to you. I'm certainly not gloating, no matter what. Kelly still loves you, regardless of your thoughts. I also have sympathy for you. I recently found out about a fire at your house, and I tried to call you during the day. You just found out? When I was sitting on the side of the road, I saw Kelly drive by in the same car. When she noticed me, she tried to hide. Overcome with anger, I forcefully hung up the phone, losing all common sense. I thanked Sam and his wife for the treat and left despite their attempts to prevent me from leaving. Sam clearly understood that I was going to indulge in heavy drinking. I headed to a familiar place, the VC, that I often visited before Kelly appeared in my life. The irony that the initials of this place are now associated with it struck me, as they served as a reminder of an important event that I am unlikely to forget. Sitting down at the bar, I began to drink one drink after another. Despite the reluctance of the bartender, Persuasion prevailed, and he reluctantly continued to serve me, and much more than he should have. By this time, I was already in a strong intoxication and barely restrained myself from opening my lips. Suddenly, Kelly and Gina came in. Kelly's eyes were red and swollen from crying, and Gina looked furious. But their presence no longer mattered to me. 
I just sat and savored the last glass, indifferent to everything that surrounded me. The bartender deliberately avoided my place at the bar. Sensing my disappointment, Kelly came up to me, trying to hug me. Pushing her away, I was furious that she even tried to do it. What's the matter with you, Dave? Is it because Mike and I rode in his jeep today? She asked. I couldn't help but feel offended when I answered, Sorry, I'm sorry. I caught you fooling around with him. Trying to reason with me, Kelly insisted, Dave, you're intoxicated, and you're not thinking straight. Let's go to my place and discuss everything. Experiencing mixed emotions, I stubbornly declared, We'll talk right here, or we won't talk at all. Despite my intoxicated and enraged state, my love for her remained so deep that I could not even bring myself to utter such an offensive word as trash. Deep down, I was sure she had betrayed me. Dave, there seems to be a serious misunderstanding between us. I want you to know that my feelings for you have not changed, and I still deeply love you. Please change your mind and come back to my house, Kelly expressed sincerely. Gina came closer to me for the first time, expressing her disappointment. If you weren't in such a state of intoxication and despair, I might have reacted differently. Kelly adores you, and you're here pushing her away. It's time to drop your ego, Dave. You need to rest and talk calmly in the morning. By the way, you've been such a wonderful presence in my life for the last two years, but it seems that in your eyes, I have always been surrounded by some kind of negativity. You've been wanting me to end up with Kelly ever since day one. I finished the contents of my glass and took the last one left on the bar. As I drank it, a wave of dizziness and numbness came over me from the excessive amount of alcohol I drank. My consciousness became confused, and eventually, I lost consciousness. The bartender and the girls helped carry me to Kelly's car. When I woke up the next morning, I was greeted by a throbbing headache. Slowly, I got out of bed and headed to the bathroom. After a while, I was able to get up and move around. To my surprise, my clothes were washed and neatly folded on a chair in the corner of the room. When I got dressed, I realized that my pockets were empty. When I went into the kitchen to have a drink, I saw that Gina and Kelly were sitting there, seeming to be waiting for me. Gina, true to her usual smart demeanor, quipped, We're not in a good mood, are we? I was taken aback because I expected her to celebrate her victory over me. Kelly just sat there, not looking up from the table, annoyed. I turned to them with the words, well, I hope you are satisfied now. Kelly didn't sleep a wink yesterday, and you're happy about it. I'm far from satisfied. Do you realize how much trouble you caused us last night? It was terrible to see your apartment on fire. But what really crossed all the boundaries was when you decided to leave the apartment and got drunk in that dubious bar. Sam informed me that you were very upset, but he couldn't convince you to stay. By the time Kelly and I arrived, you had already escaped and found refuge in this dumpster-like establishment. Wait, wait, how did you even know about Sam? When did you talk to him, and how do you even know him? I asked in confusion. Dave, Kelly contacted your parents and managed to figure out Sam's location. He told us about where you might be. We visited the first three places, but you were nowhere to be found. But at the last place, you were in such a state of intoxication, which I have not seen in all the time we met. It was quite shocking. But still, don't worry, you will never see me like this again, Gina explained. Did you bring me here just to gloat and wipe your feet on me? I got angry, not understanding why I was brought to Kelly in the first place. I assumed that my parents had asked Kelly to look after me as a precaution. I looked directly at Kelly for the first time and noticed how her shoulders were shaking. She was in tears, feeling completely desperate. I sank into a chair and stared fixedly at the only person who owned my heart. Gina's gaze pierced right through me, after which she walked over to the table in the corner with a stern expression on her face. She took out the things hidden there from her pockets, a receipt for ordering dinner, a certificate of a recent purchase of clothes, and a charred box in which the ring was once kept. It was hidden in your pockets, she said with annoyance in her voice. I found them before I washed your clothes. Maybe you can explain to Kelly the meaning of these three incomprehensible objects. I, for one, am looking forward to your explanations. Gina drew my attention to the two receipts in the box. As I looked at them, a wave of embarrassment swept over me, causing my face to turn red. 
Kelly had stopped crying and was now looking at me. But before I made a fool of myself, I needed to get answers. Kelly, why did you go with him, and why did you try to hide your face when I noticed you? I begged, desperately seeking understanding. You can't understand, Dave, Kelly replied dismissively. Mike came to pick me up. He found out about the fire at your house and took me with him to see if there was anything suitable for rescue. When I saw you sitting on the side of the road, your condition was extremely serious. Not knowing what to do, I instinctively decided to resort to an ill-considered action. I'll clarify right away that I just wanted to invite you to my place. That's it, seriously, Dave. You need to stop being so unreasonable. She cares about you a lot more than you deserve. Although I can't understand it myself, at least you could be kinder to her. She's not doing well either, Gina attacked me, and it finally dawned on me that she was right. I completely misinterpreted the events of the last 24 hours, and I've never tried to ruin your relationship with Kelly. Moreover, I've always supported and encouraged both of you. It is unfair and insulting that you accuse me without any evidence or grounds. Instead of focusing on negativity and suspicion, let's remember the love and connection that unites us all. It is important to trust each other and communicate openly. I understand that you may feel protective of Kelly, but please understand that my intentions have always been sincere and respectful. I genuinely care about Kelly, and I want her to be happy. I hope that you will be able to see this and put aside any doubts or hostility that you may have towards me. I tried to reconcile the two of you. Kelly was thinking about ending her relationship with you and continuing her relationship with Mike. He constantly remembers important dates and details that you often forget. Just let me explain. Kelly truly loves you, but lately, it seems to her that you don't reciprocate. She got the impression that you are on the verge of breaking up with her. I did not agree with her point of view and expressed my thoughts. If you weren't so inattentive to important dates and other issues, both of you would probably be much happier now. It's incredibly difficult for me to protect you, especially when you're acting stupid like yesterday. I couldn't help but feel like a complete idiot at that moment, a feeling that still haunted me. It suddenly dawned on me that Gina had been on my side all this time. Reflecting on my failures of the previous day, I let negativity cloud my judgment, assuming the worst in any situation. As I sat there, I was overcome by a deep sense of stupidity, holding in my hands a receipt confirming that we were going to have dinner at Del Rio's restaurant. I realized that my reservation had been cancelled because some obnoxious rich man had booked the whole place, and it was at Del Rio that I was hoping to invite you to dinner last night. I wanted to ask you about something important, and I wanted this evening to be unforgettable for you. Del Rio's? You know what's the big deal? It's just a restaurant, Kelly remarked. But as it turned out, this is the best place in the city. Oh, Dave, you remember that today is Valentine's Day and even booked a table? Gina expressed her disbelief. Yes, but it's not much use because they canceled the order. But you remember, Dave, this is the main thing for me. Oh, and I bought myself a new suit. I went through a lot to get it, I added. Gina's face showed complete shock when she expressed her disbelief. It was clear that she could not imagine that I would ever look into this store for clothes. I must admit I have always been a simple man in blue jeans and a t-shirt. Kelly looked at me strangely, clearly doubting my decision. Both Gina and Kelly were stunned, and I couldn't help but enjoy the effect it had on them. If only it had happened under more favorable circumstances. When I held the ring in my hand, the memories came flooding back to me and caused a sudden rush of inspiration. Determined, I got down on one knee in front of Kelly and took her hands in mine. Taking a deep breath, I prepared to ask the most difficult question I've ever asked anyone. Confusion flashed across Kelly's face, and she looked at Gina, whose hands were firmly pressed to her mouth. Gina, having noticed the ring and understood my intentions last night, knew what Kelly was missing. Admitting my recent behavior, I confessed to Kelly that I was not at ease yesterday and today. I may not be the most impressive ladies' man, and I don't know how to remember important dates, but I'm sure of one thing, Kelly, I'm deeply in love with you. My love for you is sincere and unshakable. Carefully placing the box in Kelly's hands, I intertwined her fingers and held her tightly to me, gazing intently into her eyes. I plucked up the courage and asked what was on my mind. Kelly, 
I understand that the situation is not the best, and things have not been going so smoothly lately. I am painfully aware of my stupidity, thinking that you left me for Mike, and I should have known better about it. But despite all this, Kelly, will you marry me? Gina was stunned by my unexpected question, her breath caught in her throat as tears streamed down Kelly's face. There was a deep emotion on her face that I had never seen before. The silence that followed seemed to drag on endlessly, filling the room with an exorbitant weight. I took a quick look at Gina and then returned to Kelly, not knowing what to say about it. With a gentle gesture, Kelly leaned over to me and carefully opened the box in front of her. Inside was a ring, the brilliance and radiance of which were not inferior to the beauty of the woman holding it in her hands. Trembling hands carefully removed the ring from the soft case and with extreme precision put it on the fourth finger of the left hand. The ring fit flawlessly, as if it was meant to be. I was stunned by the statement of the jeweler as he assured me that in order for the ring to fit her, it would need to be resized. But my surprise quickly turned into joy when Kelly wrapped her arms around me and pulled me close. Yes, Dave, I will marry you, she said, and her hot tears touched my cheek. Hugging her tightly, I noticed that Gina was crying too. We hugged Kelly and kissed passionately. Her eyes were open and filled with a searching look that I couldn't understand. Suddenly, Gina pulled Kelly away from me and hugged her tightly, her heart poured out in her arms. They were both crying and looking at the ring, tears streaming down their faces. I sat up from my seat for a moment but immediately sat back down. I watched them whirl around the room, their voices full of delight and surprise. Sitting in place, I suddenly heard the phone ring. The answering machine went off, and a familiar voice filled the room. Kelly, it's me, Mike. Listen, I have something important to tell you. Dave's not right for you, especially after what happened yesterday. Listen, let me invite you to dinner, and we can talk. Before Kelly or I could react, Gina quickly picked up the phone and interjected, Hey, Mike, are you still here? Gina's expression turned sour as she absorbed Mike's words. Look, she began, Kelly isn't interested in you or any other guy. She's found herself someone special, so off. Angry, Gina abruptly interrupted the conversation and burst out laughing. Kelly joined her, and before I knew it, I burst out laughing too. I was taken aback by Gina's outburst of anger towards Mike, but now it became clear that she really had some sympathy for me or at least tolerated my presence. Later in the evening, when we were lying together in Kelly's bed, she put her head on my chest. The soft light illuminated the engagement ring she was looking at, creating a gentle atmosphere. Even with the dim lighting, it continued to shine. Straining my eyes, I noticed that a single tear glistened in her eye. Worried, I cautiously asked Kelly, what's bothering you? She hesitated for a moment and then quietly replied, nothing at all. In fact, everything seems incredibly right. Everything is just perfect. With irresistible tenderness, she uttered those three important words, I love you, Dave. Soon, we were eagerly preparing for a modest wedding. Kelly was happy, a smile never left her face. Gina helped my future wife in everything. She was always with us. I realized how much I was wrong about Gina, she turned out to be a very good person. Sometimes I felt very ashamed that I thought she wanted us to break up with Kelly. As for Mike, he tried to contact my dear Kelly more than once, but fortunately for me, she avoided any conversations and meetings with him. I was more confident than ever in her love and loyalty. Shortly before the wedding, Kelly pleased me with very exciting news. One evening she stayed late after work, which greatly worried me. But not for long, returning an hour later, Kelly said that I would become a father, and she would become a mother. From happiness and confusion, I was speechless. I just couldn't figure out for a few seconds if these were real words or a prank. I understood alone I was happier than ever. My dear Kelly and I had a bright and happy future, just as I dreamed. My life has turned into continuous happiness. Gina also pleased us with wonderful news. Her boyfriend finally decided and made her an offer to become his wife. Kelly and I were happy for our mutual friend and for her happiness.